Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our monthly Native Plant Society of Oregon Portland chapter meeting. My name is Gina Bono, and I'm a member and volunteer with the Portland chapter. NPSO promotes the enjoyment, knowledge, and protection of Oregon's native plants. We especially and warmly welcome any of our newest members this evening. As part of our mission, we present a new speaker each month on timely topics of botanical interest. Our speaker tonight is Paul Slichter, science educator and roving wildflower stalker. You'll hear more about him in a few minutes. First, I'd like to review some Zoom etiquette. Please leave your audio and video turned off throughout the duration of the program. We'll have some time afterward for additional questions, comments, and some socializing where you can turn your sound and cameras on. If you have a question during the program for Paul, please click the chat button and type in your question. Paul will address your questions at the end of the slideshow. We also have a closed captioning feature. And if you click show subtitles to see the little you can see the uh, live text of the program on screen. I'd like to remind members that if you are interested in leading or co-leading a hike this year, to please email a proposal ASAP to NPSOPDX chapter, that's NPSOPDX chapter at gmail.com to join us for an in-person gathering this Sunday, January 16th. Looking ahead to February 10th, our next program will be with Phil Hayes, who will speak about the native plants of Saddle Mountain. Now for a timely announcement regarding February's program, I would like to welcome chapter president Willow Elliott to say a few words. Go ahead, Willow. Hi there. Well, it's really fantastic to see so many people interested in the Wallowa Mountains and supporting NPSO. This is a historic number of people who are going to join us tonight. So I think we might make a little change here. And instead of having a social uh, time afterwards, let's just give Paul the whole hour to show his many incredible photos and take some questions from you folks. But I do um, want to just take a minute to tell you that we've got um, so much going on in 2022. We really are standing strong here in January. And there must be a lot of people who have cabin fever who want to look at these photos. We just want to remind you that it's time to renew. If you're a member now, if you're not a member, please join. It's uh, it's all in our website. If you want to look at the options available, it takes you to our state membership website to join. And also, it, a lot of you ask about these programs. If you can't make it that night, are you going to be able to see it later? And yes, most of the programs are recorded. They are found on our website, as Mary put in the chat. Uh, please check out that website address and look at it, and then it'll be in your search later. I do um, unfortunately need to tell you that we are not going to have our annual meeting in, in 2022 for the third year in a row. The decision had to be made. If you're thinking about it, what you're going to be planning in May, I think you just want to, I want to go ahead and just tell you that's, that's what the decision was from the Chowmel chapter in McMinnville. Um, we'll take care of that in 2024 when it's Portland's time to, to host the meeting. And it can be at Spirit Mountain if we if we hope if we choose to, to go there. Also, uh, February is coming up our annual election month. We will see if we we have anything to uh, to uh, add to our election. But I want to introduce you to the board when we do that next month. We're also looking for a communications coordinator who will help. Uh, take over the newsletter editor job for Mary so she can just be a uh, hike leader, the hike leader queen that she is so does so well. 
I'm, I'm looking for a program scheduler. Please help me find these people and get them booked for 2023. Just send an email to that um, through the website. It'll take you directly to an, uh, a Gmail inbox that I will see. We uh, also uh, always need state board committee members. If you are ever interested in that, let me know as well. Okay, it's time for the other couple other folks to talk and I will see you um, after the program or during the program, but probably we're not going to uh, continue with an open social time. Uh, ask your questions now with Paul during the during or whatever he says he'd like it to be. Thank you. Oh, and now I would like to introduce the chapter treasurer, Lisa Shaw. Uh, Lisa will be monitoring the chat tonight and we'll be introducing our speaker. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, first put on my treasurer hat and uh, let everyone know that we have just put in an order for new bandanas and new t-shirts. Um, and so those will be coming, but we still have plenty of the Bonnie Hall t-shirts for sale. And we are having our um, discounts um, online now for uh, renewing members, new members and for hike leaders. So those of you that are planning on leading hikes, uh, you get a special discount for buying uh, um, one of the new t-shirts. Um, so with that, um, I'm very honored to uh, introduce our um, speaker tonight, Paul Slichter. Uh, I know him mostly by reputation, and I find his photos on a variety of websites. Um, I have yet to attend a hike with him, um, but that's because I don't often get to the Wallawas or to the Seven Devil Man, uh, Mountains or even to the Simcoe's. <clears throat> Um, Paul is a retired high school biology teacher. He taught at Gresham High and has had a lifelong interest in nature. He became active with the Native Plant Societies, both Oregon and Washington, in the 1980s, documenting plants found along the Pacific Northwest Trails. He actually found out about the Native Plant Society um, through a flower show that they used to host where they would actually have live flowers on display. Uh, I do believe that one of the uh, Valley um, chapters is still doing that. Um, so with his students, um, he actually uh, created and manages one of the oldest wildflower websites. And uh, after I close, I will put uh, the link in there. It's Halley Hosting, uh, sciencehalleyhosting.com. Um, so I will put that in there. And he also um, has flowers, like I said, for the Oregon wildflower, um, Oregon flora and Oregon wildflower apps. Um, he, um, he helped, um, he kind of got this um, app together because the students were taking all these wonderful pictures and wanted a way to help each other ID them and to document them. So, and he continues to do that for a variety of organizations, as I said. Um, he actively assists, assists other various public agents plant monitoring and plant surveys, especially in the gorge and more remote areas. Uh, when he's not out hiking with friends, uh, he's sitting at his computer processing all of these flowers and the animal photos and placing them on the internet. Um, one place that you can find some of his um, pictures and that he also helps manage is the MPSO Facebook page. Um, and look, one other Facebook page he mentioned, maybe he'll say it again in his presentation. Um, so if he's not inside and he's moving and he can't get on a trail um, because the gorge road is closed or whatever, he's out in his yard creating habitat. So we are very lucky to have Paul Slichter with us tonight and to go on a hike with him to the Wallawas. Paul? Can you see the screen? Is there anything in the way or anything like that? Looks good. 
Okay. We also and see that we have Camus behind you tonight. <laughs> and unfortunately, the for whatever reason, the mouse is not wanting to work. So just a second here. Um, so anyway, um, thank you for having me. Um, this is a talk about the um, underappreciated um, trails, wildflower trails of the Wallowa Mountains. Um, just a second here, I'm trying to, there's a bunch of stuff on my screen that uh, make it so I can't see the top of the, so I can't see the mouse and, but well, um, anyway, um, so anyway, this is the, the, the talk about the underappreciated wildflower trails of the Wallowa Mountains. And uh, so I'm afraid if you're looking for trails that are up um, high, you know, seeing all those alpines that are special to the um, Wallowas, um, this unfortunately is not the, the talk for that um, as uh, we're basically hiking around the periphery of the Wallowas, um, hitting trails that there aren't a lot of people on um and uh you know exploring the flora that's there you know seeing the sites that kind of thing um i will mention for this particular photo um this is a, a photo from uh, hell's canyon rim road which you access from the hell's canyon overlook um halfway between um halfway oregon and uh Wallowa, oregon and uh, so it gives you a really good um, view to the northeast side of the, the mountain and also has some interesting flowers. Um, so it's a good good place for people who maybe can't get out and walk a whole lot to go and, and, and visit um, because you can just step outside the car and, and walk a couple of pieces and see things and move on to the next spot and stop park and, and look at stuff and there's not a lot of traffic. Um, so um, I'm assuming everybody here knows where the um, Eagle Cap Wilderness is and, and the Wallowa Mountains. Um, basically, from my house in Gresham, it's almost a, a full day's drive, um, you know, east um, via um, Interstate 84, and you get to La Grand Gas Up, um, which I recommend doing. If not there, then what are the other stations on, you know, where your, your destination is? and uh, then drive on to your accommodations, whether they be a motel in one of the towns around the, the Wallowas or a campground. Um, and uh, you can kind of see uh, over on the um, right side of the Eagle Cap Wilderness, you can see the, the, the road number 39, that's the Imnaha River Road. Um, and so that's, that's one way that you can get to the east side, although there's a quicker, um, route to the east side um, by going through Joseph. And then you can see that first um, downward road heading to the right of Joseph there. That takes you up over um, Lick Creek and then down to the Imnaha and then you know over to um, Hell's Canyon Overlook and, and so forth. Um, here are a couple of the photos that you can see from uh, um, kind of the, the, the north side of the um, uh, Wallowas, and uh, so uh, gooseberry-leaved alum root is a real common um, alum root, Heuchera grossularia folia. Uh, we do have a different variety here in the gorge, which is rare, um, from about Hood River East, and then um, abundant up the Klickitat and uh, to Shoots River. Um, this is commonly on cliffs and rock outcrops and things like that. Then Blue Mountain Beard Tongue, Penstemon penelianus. Um, it's a big, big showy um, beard tongue or penstemon and uh, um, is one of the, you know, it's kind of like showy penstemon, penstemon speciosis in terms of size and, and beauty and, and so forth. And unfortunately, I don't think anybody's got that currently in uh, um, cultivation. Now, I did want to mention um, part of the reason we're, we're going out and doing underappreciated trails is number one, we like to go places um, where there's not a lot of foot traffic, you know, have more of the wilderness experience. And so hence going around the periphery of the Wallowas. And then number two, part of my deal is to uh, 
um, kind of record what's what can be found there. So this is actually from the Oregon Flora Project um, webpage, and I did a search um, using a polygon search, um, and the uh, Oregon Flora Project webpage has a, a, a resources page that tells you how to do that. Um, but this shows all the um, records, both observations and collections of, of voucher specimens um, around the Wallowas. And uh, so, you know, you can see there's quite a few um, plants there, but most of them are kind of one or two or three plants from a particular area, and they're not real inclusive, um, you know, uh, collections of, of data for like a section, you know, um, you know, like a mile square. Uh, or a trail or a place around the mountain. Um, and so that's part of the reason I'm, you know, out with my clipboard in hand um, looking at the plants. And I just wanted to show here the another cool function of the Oregon Flora Project uh, webpage is um, you can also do a search for inventories of plants. And so this just shows you the plant list for the specific for the Wallowas. And it's actually kind of sparse compared to most other um, parts of the state. To the lower left, you can see Interstate 84, and those red dots are, um, you know, collections of data, plant lists for those particular sections of freeway. Um, and then you can see there's a few scattered through the um, Wallowas. There is, I think, two or three big um, inventories that are like, one of them is like the whole central part of the Wallowas, um, where it's a list that you can print out. Um, you can change it any way that you want. You know, if you had cell phone access, say you're standing on top of Mount Howard and had good cell phone access, you could actually pull that up and click on the, the plant names from the list and, and see what the plants look like in real time. Um, there's also one, I think, for um, the um, drive um, between uh, Wallowa and uh, um, Halfway, which could be pretty convenient. Um, and uh, I think there's another one for, for Hat Point, which would be up on the upper right um, up there. And then a few other things just to kind of get away here at the beginning. Um, so it's always good to kind of stock up on, um, you know, whatever resources you can. So um, we always like to hike with maps because um, we sit down at lunchtime and identify all the peaks and things just in case we get chased off the trail by a pack of wolves or something like that and got to find our way bushwhacking back through the, the countryside, which I don't recommend in steep country. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's, it's, there's a number of maps that you can get. Um, and I think these are the main maps. Um, there are some other um, district maps that you can get. Um, two hiking books that you can see there, which we use quite a bit. Um, I like Sullivan's book down below there. Um, the, the 100 Hikes of Eastern Oregon, just because it gives you a little bit more information. The Hiking Oregon's Eagle Cap Wilderness, um, you know, gives some details, but, you know, kind of is short on the aesthetics, I guess you might say. It does have, though, more of the, the excuse me, the trails um, in there that are found in the, in the wilderness and around the periphery. Um, and of note, you, you, you do want to take note of the, um, the elevation gain or loss um, during particular hikes, because of course that's going to be a limiting factor. Some people, like myself, um, unfortunately, I went elsewhere as a youngster and uh, wore myself out, and so it's pretty hard to spend a day trip um, or, or even a backpacking trip into the heart of the um, Wallow Mountains um, anymore. So, um, hence again the day trips. Um, have a you know a kind of a soft spot for sweet vetches, and so. This is boreal sweet vetch to your right there, Hetty Serum Boreal, um, actually from the Lostine, I believe blooms kind of mid to late June most years. Um, tried to include a map here and I hope people can, can read it. And so I've included um, some of the trails um, that I'm gonna mention here and uh, um, also a few um, place names or whatever that I'll mention here in a little while. Um, and uh, so you can see Legrand, um, on the um, left, upper left, and that's a good base, uh, or Elgin is, for exploring the um, northwest part of the Wallowas. There's a number of trails that you can go up to. They're not the spectacular ones necessarily with the big expansive views of icy peaks and things. You'll see them in the distance, 
um, but you know there's a distinct type of plant set of plants that are are found in that particular spot um, and then uh, maybe closer to, to get to the um, southwest part of the mountains probably better to stay down in Baker City or maybe North Powder or Union or maybe even at the Hot Lake Hotel um, which I, I believe is still going um, for the southeast part of the mountain halfway is a good way to, to, to a good place to stay if you're staying in a motel or something like that or a trailer park or whatever there because that gives you pretty good access um, to that area beneath the, the cornucopia label um, and uh, the, the southeast part of the mountain, including the Hell's Canyon Rim Drive and Hell's Canyon Overlook. And then again, um, Enterprise and Joseph and, and the campground at uh, um, Wallowa Lake, um, those are all good spots for, for accessing the northeast side. Um, though again, I do want to warn that if you're planning on like hiking one day, um, out based out of Enterprise, say at Macaulay Basin, um, you know, that's an easy get to from, from, from Joseph and Enterprise. Um, but to go all the way down to the, the trails um, near Dead Men Canyon and halfway Cornucopia, that kind of place, that's, you know, you're talking two hours or more of driving, maybe even three, because um, it's windy, slow road and lots to see. Um, so just be aware that it's not easy doing um, hikes you know, based off of things, you know, completely on the other side of the, um, the mountain range. So getting to the um, trails and, and some of the plants and things like that. Um, here's my erstwhile hiking companions, um, Susan Saul and her pup um, Hattie, which is the small dog with the orange scarf below her. And uh, we're hiking up to Maxwell Lake. Um, and that's actually up in the Lostine, which is a fairly popular place to go. Um, but on a um, midweek, um, it's, it's not a bad place to, to go, um, other than the fact that midday you get a lot of people going up to swim in the lake. Um, part of the trail, about half the trail is good switchbacks, good, good gradual um, tread, and then all of a sudden it becomes a primitive trail and pretty much follows the, the um, fall line and uh, eventually breaks up out of the, tra to the trees and gets you to meadows of that snuttle Petals linanthastrum um, on the you know the white flowers and clusters. There's some um, alpine knotweed, which is polygonum, uh, or excuse me, aconognagon um, phytolassifolium, and uh, let's see, you know, there's some other things in there. You know, a little bit of white bark pine, which I'm hearing is um, getting some listing. Um, as a sensitive or endangered species. And, you know, when you finally do make it up to Maxwell Lake, um, you know, there's, you know, quite a scenic um, view um, and, and a decent place for, for people to spread out, you know, as long as there's not hordes and hordes and hordes. Um, and so we just did that as a pretty easy um, day hike um, one day. Probably would go back again at some point, maybe a little bit earlier to see the spring, spring flowers. Um, one of the endemics to, to Northeast um, Oregon and a little bit into um, Southeast Washington and, and West Central Idaho is the Piper's Buckwheat, Eriogonum flavum variety piperi. Um, again, perhaps somebody is growing these, you know, in the Tri-Cities or Walla Walla or someplace like that, but um, it's, it's a nice um, showy plant, but unfortunately, um, not for sale, you know, for, for people to put in their gardens. Looks a lot like the um, sulfur buckwheat, um, Eriogonum umbilatum, um, especially in leaf and flower form. But you'll notice on those long stems, there's no um, ring of leafy bracts about mid step, um, uh, mid, mid stem or right below the, the um, inflorescence. So that's the way you can tell this from the um, sulfur flower buckwheat Eriogonum. Um, umbilatum, which is also found in this particular area. Um, Nuttles linantha, linanthus, Leptosiphon natalii, um, quite a, a pretty phlox like plant. You know, to the uninitiated, it does look like phlox. Um, I have seen this a couple of times. I've, I've grown it a few times. It's short lived, um, you know, way back when uh, the Berry Botanical Garden was um, active, um, you know, and having plant cells and things like that. They actually um, had plants that people could buy and uh, was one of the ways that they fundraised. 
Um, and uh, so um, quite nice. It will make a plate size cluster of those um, beautiful five petaled white flowers. Um, and I did plant one of these um, at my mom's house um, in Spokane. It's probably lived there for 20 years. I don't know that it flowers a whole lot, but it is fairly hardy in the, in the right spot. Um, and this is real common in uh, like up at Mount St. Helens, if you wanna see it closer. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it's real common in the North Oregon Cascades, um, but it's common through the peaks of uh, much of the Central and, and Eastern Oregon. Um, another plant that's really um, cool and pretty is the Big Pod Mariposa. And you find this all over the place, along trails, long roads. Um, it's all over the place on the, the road between Halfway and Wallowa. Um, this is um, Calicortis uricarpus, um, and uh, again, can either be kind of white or very, very pinkish um, in color, and it has that big um, purplish um, dot uh, or spot in the middle of each of the um, petals. Um, also along the shoreline at uh, Maxwell Lake, um, there is Western Labrador tea, which is used to be a ledum, genus ledum. Now it's Rhododendron columbianum. Um, they're kind of low, kind of azalea-like plants. Um, and we do have some Labrador teas over on the coast. Um, I don't believe the, those are this, uh, but quite nice plants. And, and I believe this was probably August when we hiked this. So they were still in bloom at that particular time. Again, requiring a little bit more moist um, soils. And another view of, of Maxwell Lake. Again, there's um, you know lots of rock on the far side where probably you'd get you know um, some some interesting rock plants, um, and then uh, a lot of the shoreline, especially the um, outlet end, has a, a nice meadow with uh, plants to, to take a look at, including Pink Mountain Heather, which we of course have all over the place in the Cascades, um, Philodoce um, and Petroformis, and uh, Another favorite of mine is the yellow columbine, Aquilegia flavescence, um, and flavescence means yellow. Um, most of them are yellow, although a few of them will have a bit of a reddish or orangish tinge upon those spurs. Um, pretty common uh, plant in moisture soils, kind of forest openings through the wallowas. Um, I don't know if it gets all the way to uh, um, the Oregon Cascades, it is in the central Washington Cascades around Ellensburg, um, if you were up there to see them. And uh, another favorite of mine is the globe penstemon, penstemon globosus. Um, these tend to get to be about a foot tall, and you can see the inflorescence is pretty tight and kind of roundish, hence the name globe um, penstemon. Um, and they're found pretty much on the um, east side of the um, Wallowa Mountain um, range there usually out in open kind of sandy, um, gravelly soils. And of course, um, every once in a while, if you're near rockfall and things, you do see pikas. Um, the one thing that we found out about the pikas at this particular location is that they have a different eep. And uh, so kind of interesting, you know, trying to decipher what they're meaning because I'm used to this, the speech of the, our local pikas here. Um, another trail that we've hiked um, is the North Fork Catherine Creek Trail. And uh, I think we did this right after the annual meeting um, um, that Portland um, hosted in, in uh, Prineville a couple of years back. And we specifically went and camped at uh, Catherine Creek State Park. No, this is not the one in the gorge. This is a park um, south of Union, um, Oregon. And uh, um, so the first day that we had planned to hike this, it was rainy, it was forecast to be nice. So we went and did the, the east side up to um, oh, the Hell's Canyon um, Rim Overlook. And uh, the second day then we did hike into the um, wilderness um, via the North Fork Catherine Creek Trail. And I think probably we were the first people to hike in for the season. You know, they had maybe about two miles worth of the trail trimmed. Um, and, you know, down logs and things off. And uh, so one thing I do want to mention that on trails is, you know, if you're a little bit unsteady of, uh, as of feet, um, you do want to check and see whether there's bridges over creeks and things. So this particular bridge 
at a um, big sturdy bridge over North Fork Catherine Creek, uh, but all the other minor um, creeks um, were fords. And early in season, when there's lots of snow melt, you know, this was June 12th, and it did rain quite a bit the day, the day before. Um, you know, the, the, the creeks were um, pretty, um, you know, flowing pretty fast. And there was one ford where we almost lost Hattie because, you know, she I put her on the far shore, went back to um, get Susan's pack, and, and Hattie followed me back and fell in the water. And so I had to grab her real fast. Um, and she was probably never in real da any danger, but wasn't a happy camper. Um, so anyway, um, the you can see over to the left side, Catherine Creek there. Um, so again, best access is from uh, Lagrand to Hot Lake to Union. And then um, the Catherine Creek State Park is right below the CNR in Creek um, and was probably about half an hour's drive then to the trailhead for the Catherine, uh, um, North Fork Catherine Creek Trailhead. And some of the, you know, this is more of a forested hike as far as we got. Um, I think we got in about five miles, almost making it to Catherine Creek. Um, and uh, so again, lots of plants just starting to bloom, Piper's anemone here, which is very similar to our, um, oh, what, uh, um, anemone oregina that we have around here. Again, multiples of colors, just like the um, our Oregon anemone, um, bigger than the Lyles. Um, I think the main particular difference is the how the stem is oriented underground, whether it's level or vertical. I believe this is a vertical rhizome or stem under the ground. Um, the number of orchids that we saw, we were of course pleased to see Mountain Lady Slippers, Cypripedium montanum. And uh, um, again, those are wide ranging in mountainous areas through the West. Um, sp spotted coral roots, always a delight to see with those little white lower lips and, and red spots on them. And again, can be varying colors from kind of an orangey red to a kind of a burnt red um, to even yellow or, or um, kind of a cream color. Um, common loop, lupin along this particular trail was the spurred lupin, which we do have in the gorge, Western Gorge um, and Eastern Gorge. Um, note on the two pictures at left, um, the label B, which shows you that what the spur looks like. And then for identifying this particular um, lupin, it's, you know, it's got um, at, at A, um, on the upper photo, you can see there's a bunch of white lines. There's little white hairs on the side petals, um, which helps separate that is, this out from some of the other spurred lupins. And then if you look at the um, outer surface of the upper petals um, at A on the lower picture, you can see there's a bunch of hairs. So, um, you know, whether a lupin flower has hairs on the upper banner petal or not, um, that's what you're looking for. And that's that's a way when you're keying them out to um, help key them. Um, and another way that I use to identify this by, by sight from yards away without looking at the flowers um, is again, the spurs. And then you can see there's no um, basal leaves on that picture of the, the plant at, at right. Um, and it's kind of fairly open and the, the, the flowers, you know, it's not a sh real long inflorescence, you know, it's fairly short. and you know, pretty evenly spaced, um, you know, widely spaced flowers. Um, so then we're moving on to a, a different trail, um, which we had the pleasure of hiking a couple of times, both in August and, and July. And, uh, you know, actually the July one, we could have probably been, uh, you know, another week or two earlier and, and you know, done the same hike and seen pretty much new, new stuff, early stuff. Um, and uh, so this is X, well, I'll get to that where it's accessed in here in a second. Here you can see Susan Hattie sitting in a bald, I think this was in August when we visited um, with um, arrow leaf balsam roots already senesced. And there's, I think probably rigid um, sagebrush. And so a lot of Eastern um, Oregon influenced, you know, more shrub step kinds of plants. Um, having an influence into the to the east side of the wilderness here. So there's in, on this particular trail, there's lots of um, oh, open balds, rocky balds. Um, there's lots of meadows, and then there's a fair amount of coniferous forest. Um, and uh, 
probably it, it's also not heavily burned. So, um, you know, I would recommend this as a, as a hike um, that's going to be probably open most of the time because um, you don't have to worry about hiking over dozens and dozens of, of, uh, of down trees. Um, so the Lick Creek Trail, you can see on the far right. So again, sorry that I can't get the, the uh, pointer to work, but um, it's ac accessed again um, from probably most easily from um, Enterprise and Joseph, although I suppose it's about halfway um, between um, Joseph and, and uh, halfway Oregon. Um, so you could get, get to it from that side too, if you wanted to. Um, and it basically climbs um, from uh, um, up to the, um, what's called the Imnaha Divide, which is the bridge, the top of the slope at the north side of the Imnaha River, um, which is um, pretty long river um, going down, you know, with its mouth down on the Snake River. And uh, so driving to the trailhead, you, you pass a bunch of lovely penstemons. Yes, they're lovely, but that's also their name, Penstemon venustus. And, uh, you know, like Venus means lovely, of course. And uh, um, I do want to mention that on the, the road between um, Halfway and Wallowa, you can see in probably mid-July, mid second, third week of July, most, most years, you can see 10 species of uh, penstemons in bloom. So that's kind of a draw for, for going there. Um, and uh, um, lovely penstemon is one of those, uh, probably the most common. And you know, it's really cool to be wearing sunglasses, amber sunglasses, and, and be arriving or driving that, that road um, you know, an hour or so um, before sunset or an hour or so after sunrise and, you know, the color just pops of those flowers. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not using filters or anything like that. And so, um, you know, by midday when we got to this particular point, the flowers are kind of washed out. Um, I did have this one um, planted in my yard for about 20 years and, and uh, survived. Unfortunately, I was raking out dead leaves, you know, getting the, the, that particular flower bed ready and accidentally cut the last two stems and never resprouted. So have to go back to Spokane to the nursery to get one. Um, Arrowleaf balsam root, of course, is common. You would think in the mountains, okay, what's, what's a, a prairie plant doing out there? Um, but these do grow fairly high into the mountains. Um, I do see them on the east side of the goat rocks right up to the um, Cascade Divide. Um, and up on Mount Adams, they grow up up to about timberline on the east side. So, um, you know, they, they do live any place where it's open. Um, here you can also see the purple flowers of Hooker's balsam roots. And it looks like there's probably maybe some uh, um, dagger pods and, and uh, um, some uh, either, you know, there's a pussy toes of some sort there too. Um, this is what the hooker's, uh, hooker's onion or taper tip onion looks like. And this is common all over Oregon and Washington. I think even to some extent out on Bald's west of the Cascades. Um, I do have a plant that's spread. Um, it's about a foot wide, it's never flowered, um, but I've had, had them for probably 20, 25 years out in the garden. Um, reliable spreader. Um, probably needs to be a little bit more confined and um, not so much water, that kind of thing. Um, you know, lots of meadows and things filled with flowers along the um, Lick Creek Trail. Um, this happens to be, I believe, Canby's Lovage, um, Ligusticum canby -i. Um, And uh, you know, there's a few, uh, probably, you know, it could be um, linear leaf uh, paintbrush in there. If not, then it's harsh paintbrush. Um, and uh, some Hakelia. Um, stick seed and, and uh, um, you know, a smattering of conifers and things like that. I'm making a guess that, uh, you know, if you'd hiked this 20, 30 years ago, this landscape would have been much more open um, with warming winters and things. Those conifers are able to grow all basically most of the winter long. And so they've gotten big and uh, at That's least at this particular site, there's no, um, you know, hasn't been a fire to, to restrict them. Um, glandular paintbrush, Castellasia um, glandulifera, and I think probably that's um, more of the Piper's buckwheat in front of it there. Um, 
Glendill paintbrush is one of several yellowish paintbrushes from the, this particular area. And don't see this very often. This is uh, used to be called Suxdorfia ranunculifolia. Um, it's buttercup leaf mock brook foam, kind of a mouthful. And so you can see a little um, native bee there working over the flowers in the picture at left. And you know it's difficult. It's you know it's a saxifrage family member, um, and uh, so it's definitely got that flower form. Um, and then it's got kind of nice little kind of um, buttercupy leaves. You know, hence its hence its name. Um, a little bit higher up, you know, getting onto the divide itself, Imnaha Divide. Um, it's just showing, you know, again, wildflower meadows and things like that. These particular photos were taken in, in August um, 2018. And so, you know, the bulk of the wildflower season is done. Things are drying out, that kind of thing. Um, you know, July was, you know, when our, we did our July visit, uh, it was much more floriferous. In fact, at this particular spot, the, the uh, lupins were just starting to bloom. And uh, the, of course, the other thing about visiting in August was that, uh, um, you know, there's lots of smoke. So we did happen to hit um, two days, you know, we planned it perfectly, got two days of hiking with um, not a lot of smoke. Um, although on this particular day, we could only see about five or six miles because of the smoke, mostly coming from uh, um, fires over in Idaho. Um, pretty common um, species, Eaton's um, flea bane across Oregon and into Southeast Washington. Um, this happens to be um, variety Velosus. Um, it's pretty little um, daisy, native daisy, um, kind of cespitos. Gets about, probably about three or four inches tall, something like that, kind of lavender flowers. Um, again, this one's common over much of central Oregon. Um, endemic to, you know, the Snake River area is Q6 aster. This used to be a variant of the um, leafy asters, um, Symphiotrichum cusicii. Um, and uh, broad flower heads, um, broad clasping leaves, again, found kind of in riparian areas, places, meadows where it's a little bit wetter, um, usually, you know, within the first um, three, four weeks after snow melt. And here we got a couple of, I think, Melissa Blues, um, um, I think getting ready to, to, to mate on Green's Golden Bush, um, Erica Maria Greenii. If you want to see Erica Maria Greenii locally, just go up to uh, Cloud Cap on uh, Mount Hood, and uh, it grows all over the east side of, you know, Timberline of Mount Hood. A nice little kind of a sub shrub, um, mini shrub, um, up to about a foot tall with kind of yellow, somewhat daisy-ish flowers. Um, now this is the opposite here. This is like a five, six foot tall plant, tall larkspur, Delphinium glaucum. Um, some of you remember this, perhaps if you're old timers, remember this as Western um, larkspur, um, used to be called Delphinium occidental. Um, and uh, um, you know we saw quite a bit of this this summer down on the Siskiyous on the PCT. Um, you know, it's in the Olympics, it's, you know, various places. Um, I don't know that it's in the Cascades, North Cascades, though, near Portland. And um, this one, I had to spend a little bit of time figuring out what it was. Um, and I forgot to mention, there is not a lot of plant books specific for the Wallowas. This is kind of the old standby. I don't know if I can. Okay, it doesn't show up because it's green. Okay. Um, so it's called Guide to the Plants of Wallowa Mountains of Northeastern Oregon by Georgia Mason. And uh, um, it's been revised you know, within the last five years or so. Um, it's an old style book, you know, has descriptions, keys, um, line, you know, kind of small line drawings. Um, unfortunately, not totally com complete. So, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to use Oregon flora and, and other um, source of information. Um, but uh, brickle bush is a nice little um, shrub, and uh, again, there were you know, butterflies flocking to this um, along several of the trails that we were hiking. Okay, we're we're doing another day trip um, out from our camping spot on the east side of the Wallowas, and uh, this time we're driving from the Imnaha. There's several nice um, campgrounds down on the Imnaha River itself, 
and uh, coming up um, onto the ridge on the, the south side of the Imnaha. And uh, so there's a cute little campground, um, you know, probably about four or five campsites um, used mostly by fly fishermen and uh, gives you a, a view of the southeast side of the, um, the um, range. And I'm wanting to say that that peak at the um, right, at the center, excuse me, is um, Arsenic Peak. Arsenic Peak. Aneroid Peak, sorry. Um, the one thing I'll mention about this particular spot is if you don't like mosquitoes early in the season, um, probably not going to stay here very long. And uh, so you can see we're going to head over to Dead Man Canyon Trail, um, which is at the lower right. And uh, um, again, probably most easily um, accessed um, from halfway. Um, there's several north-south trending canyons um, between what, what you see as Cornucopia and the Dead Man Canyon Trail. And each, of, each of the valleys has a trail. I'm gonna make a guess, you know, maybe less than 100 hikers, maybe less than 50 hikers during the hike, hiking season for each of them during the year. Um, the one caveat to keep in mind is for all of them, see if you can contact um, the Forest Service Office and Enterprise and, uh, uh, or perhaps down in halfway and talk to a recreation person and uh, um, they might be able to tell you whether the, tr the trails have been logged out. Again, unfortunately, on the east side of the mountain, you know, the bulk of the trails have had um, big, significant wildflower or wildfire da um, damage um, over the last dozen or so years. And, um, you know, it takes about a dozen to 20 years for all the trees to fall over. And then once that happens, then they can, you know, cut a permanent path uh, for people to hike. And unfortunately, some of the, the, the trails aren't getting hiked a lot and tread is getting hard to see. This is what it looks like at the trailhead, a big meadow. Um, as it's, you know, this likewise, we've hiked a couple of times because um, we do like it. Um, and uh, um, there is a little camp um, ground or campsite, several campsites at the trailhead itself. And Fish Lake is nearby. It's a big reservoir um, for irrigation out around halfway, has a decent um, set of campsites and has potable water. And that's one thing I do want to mention on the forest. Not many of the, the campgrounds have potable water. So, you know, for our, for our needs, we stopped at the um, city park in, in uh, uh, Wallowa and uh, um, tanked up on, you know, a bunch of uh, collapsible water bladders and took them with us um, for, for use for our four or five night um, trips. Um, hiking from or out into the meadows, then you get um, elephant heads, which we see all over the Cascades where it's wet and again, all over mountainous central Oregon. Um, and so you can see why the plant gets the name elephant head there on the right if you've never encountered this. Um, and uh, quite pretty when you get the, the full meadow um, in, in bloom. Would love to spend more time here and, and go out and try and figure out what all the sedges and um, meadow grasses and things are someday. Um, now we, as I said, hiked this twice. It's the first time we did in August. Um, it took us probably half hour, maybe even 45 minutes to go maybe a quarter mile. And you can see all the dead fire damaged trees here. Basically, you know, the, the trail disappeared under all the, the downed trees. You know, they'd locked it out, but more trees had fallen down. And uh, so it was difficult trying to get through without, you know, climbing over four or five foot high, you know, logs across the trail. Second time we did it, you know, we had two or three um, logs across the trail and we did it in five minutes. So um, again, um, do want to emphasize that some of the trails are, can be difficult to um, find tread on or, or get through because of down trees. Um, this we were early enough, um, you know, there was still snow on the trail in places. And, and so we had uh, glacier lilies in bloom. Of course, we have those um, around here um, and won't be seeing them here until March probably. Um, out in the gorge, I mean, um, getting out of the trees up into the higher meadows, um, alpine shooting stars, there's all kinds of cool sedges, um, possibly that's um, Rocky Mountain sedge there, um, Carex scopulorum in the 
the meadow. I know that's rare up in, in I think, up in Washington. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, this is cow country, and uh, so the meadows here are grazed, not super bad. Um, you know, we did encounter cows occasionally, both times up higher um, on, on, on the slopes. Um, higher slopes, um, lots of silky lupin. So you can see what that looks like. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of Western ground cell, Senecio um, integerimus, and then um, kind of the white mounds in the lower or kind of central part of the, the picture. I think that's um, American um, or mountain sandwort, Ermogoni capillaris. And um, I'm not quite sure what all the white is up higher up on the slope. Um, a beautiful um, clover is woolly head clover. I would say this is kind of ranked second behind big head clover. Um, kind of has kind of pearly um, blossoms. They're, you know, they're big thumb size, bigger than a thumb as they spread, you know, those flowers spread outwards. Um, this is not one flower um, that you're seeing that's ahead of, you know, dozens, if not a hundred um, tubular flowers um, spreading outwards. Um, getting up into the rock a little bit higher, um, Western Spring Beauties, which we have um, in the gorge. You, know, you can see this um, by hiking the road up um, to the top of Stacker Butte um, in, in the Eastern Gorge on the Washington side. Um, pretty little um, rock garden plant and meadow plant too. Um, I should mention that you can also see this at the top of Dog Mountain, I'm wanting to say early May most years. Um, and of course, a delight always, um, steer's heads, um, Dicentra uniflora, uniflora means one um, flower. So this is related, related to bleeding hearts, um, but you can see there on the photo at, at left that it does kind of look like a steer's head with, with horns um, and kind of like a little um, hairy um, knot of hair on the, on the forehead there. These are really, really early blooming um, plants, you know, blooming right as the snow um, comes off. And so we did see a slope with snow on it and got off the trail briefly and, and went over to look and indeed did find them. Susan's a real good um, steer's heads finder. And another plant that we see in the Eastern Gorge, but it's always fun to see just because um, Eastern Oregon, Central Oregon, they seem to be more numerous, um, is the dwarf Hesperochiron, Hesperochiron pumulus. And uh, so again, out on kind of swaley, moist um, slopes um, where the ground is, is, is moist, you know, from recent snow melt. And again, appearing, leaves appear within days after the, the snow melts and then flowers, you know, within a week to two weeks afterwards. Getting a little bit higher up on the Imna High Divide itself, looking at Aneroid Mountain there in the, um, at center, that's the um, Imna High Valley. Um, kind of going from right to center. Um, and then it's hard to see it um, going to the left further. Um, but on the ridge top itself, you've got um, kind of rock garden plants, all kinds of cool things. And so here we've got um, shrubby pensamen, which we do um, have around here. A lot of us have that in our gardens, rock gardens. Um, there is uh, probably both um, worm leaf and, and lance leaf. Um, stone crop that you can kind of see there. Again, without the pointer, I can't point out that there's um, some um, oh, uh, Phenocolis chironthoides uh, um, dagger pods and several buckwheats. And I think um, there's a few plants of overleaf buckwheat in there um, and uh, various other plants. Um, Woolly mock goldenweed, um, Cenotus lan lanuginosus. Um, this is, you know, we used to be a member of a, a group um, that was kind of like the catch-all for all the plants that people, the, the botanists didn't know what to do with the Haplopappus generous genus. Um, but at some point there in the 80s, they got it all sorted out and separated into separate genera. And, and uh, so this is one of, I think, two or three other um, species in that particular genus. Um, anywhere, this happens to be up high, this is about 8,000 feet. Um, and, uh, um, excuse me, this is about 7,200 feet at this location. And this plant's probably about four inches tall, which made it difficult for me to identify it at first. 
Um, but typically it's, it's more like eight to 12 inches tall um, at lower elevations. Again, another view of the, the Imnaha um, somehow is able to, to avoid getting cows that were um, in the meadows, not in the picture. Um, you can see that the, the east side, um, you know, most of the snow melts out by, by August. And again, you can see the, the haze from um, local wildfires. Matt Buckwheat, Areogonum suspitosum. I think this is one of the few places you find this in the um, Wallowas. I should point out, I believe this is actually in the, on this particular trail at this point, we're on, in the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area, um, stepping over and going down to the Imnaha River um, Canyon itself. And then you transition into the um, uh, Eagle Cap Wilderness. Swamp onions, um, again, found in places where there's recent snow melt, a nice little, um, plant from Northeast um, Oregon. I think it's also in the Ochicos. Um, get high enough and you can look west. And I just mentioned this again, um, we haven't done any of, the, hiking, any of the, the trails off to the west in this particular picture, but there's I think four canyons from between the ridge that we're on the Imnaha Divide going west to that um, ridge of, of mountain peaks there that are all you know, 8,000, 8,500 feet high. Um, and uh, so each canyon there has its own trail going up. Don't know what the condition of the trails is, um, whether they're easy to find or not. Um, but, you know, if you want to get away from it all, um, those would be places to go hike sometime. And the far, you know, either the farther west or east you go in the Wallowas, you start getting different plants. And uh, so that's, that's always a draw. Um, I do should mention that on the Dead Man Canyon Trail, there's probably a good mile or so of the, the, the trail up at the top of the divide where it's hard to find the trail because it goes through um, meadows and there's not enough traffic to keep the trails open through the dug down to tread on, in the meadows. So you kind of have to do some dead reckoning and use your maps and things to find your way along. Um, so if somebody is you know not confident or finding their way um, using a map or something like that, probably at that point it's a good good idea to turn around. People that are confident going cross country, you know, there shouldn't be any problem. Um, more of our globe penstemon, this is, a, you know, these are big two foot wide clumps of the flowers and a little bit taller um, than the ones that I showed earlier. Um, and uh, this area is, um, there's a bunch of reservoirs up here. Um, and so you can kind of, the closest reservoir you can see there's a dam on the left side of it. Um, and so these provide water. I don't think so much for drinking water for halfway, but more for irrigation of the all the expansive fields, alfalfa fields around um, um, halfway. Another endemic, Q6 biscuit root. Um, so most places found only the plants going into fruit um, and because uh, it blooms so early, but we did get to a um, recent snowmelt field and did find a few flowers in uh, bloom, yellow blooms there. So again, found on the east side of the um, Wallowas. Moving on to another trail, we're gonna do the Tenderfoot and Bonnie Lakes trails. Um, and uh, so again, it's situated about halfway on the east side of the Wallowas between um, um, halfway and uh, Wallowa. And uh, um, basically you're, you're going up through forest, mix of forest and dry grasslands and scab lands and, and rocky areas, and then also riparian areas. And uh, quite a nice hike um, for those of us that are getting a little bit more um, elderly and, and not so agile. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of water crossings with the, the first one within the first 200 yards being the hardest. And so to get to Bonnie Lakes, you can see between on the right side of your map there, um, you can see Macaulay Basin Trail uh, at the upper right. And then right below it, you can see Macaul or Bonnie Lakes. So um, it's about, I wanna say a mile uphill to the north from Lick Creek Campground. Um, and uh, um, kind of a rough road going into a trailhead and then um, goes up, you can kind of see to the lower left, just slightly left 
and lower of the bonnie there, there's a deep dark furrow there. And so that's where the trail goes up and, and ends up at two lakes right beneath Aneroid Mountain. Um, one of the special plants to see in this along this particular hike are the giant Frasera, um, Frasera speciosa. Um, this gets to be about um, two or three feet tall and you know has those beautiful uh, spectacled uh, or, or uh, spotted um, flowers. And then sugar bowls, Clematis irsutissima. You can see this in, along a number of the trails and roads um, on the east side of the um, Wallowas. I do have, I think, three or four plants of this and occasionally do get them to, to bloom. We'll have to see whether they've survived the, the recent cold or not. Um, only can get them to grow in, in pots here um, and probably would make a good hanging basket plant. Um, moving a little bit further up in the along uh, the, the Tenderfoot and Bonnie Lake trails, we're now on the Bonnie Lake Trail, probably about a quarter mile or so, half a mile from uh, Bonnie, Lower Bonnie Lake. So we're following a creek, um, nice riparian area on the left, and then totally dry um, scablands, rocky scablands on the right. Um, this was mid August. Um, I would recommend, you know, going late July or, or um, early August to, to see a lot of the rock garden plants on this particular trail. Again, the, the downside is mosquitoes um, earlier, the, the earlier you go and the water crossing is, you know, being a little bit more difficult. Um, I think this is the first time I've seen this particular plant, Arctic Aster, Eurybia merida, um, usually found further north and or, you know, higher elevation in the, in the um, Rockies, um, but is found in the um, Wallowa Mountains. And a lot of us maybe have this particular plant in our native plant gardens, the showy fleabane, out in its rock garden habitat um, along a creek, and, or actually close to the creek. To the lower left, you can see um, Wyeth or parsnip flower um, buckwheat, um, Areogonum, her excuse me, Heracleum. There's a, um, it looks like a small pensaman, maybe Rydberg's pensaman, um, directly above the um, Origeron speciosus. And then to the upper right, there's a bunch of the alpine knotweed, Aconogonum, um, Phytolassifolium. Um, so, you know, lots of plants. Oh, and then right in front of that big boulder in front of the flea bane, there's a bunch of um, yampa, um, which is a, you know, one of the plants that natives um, dug roots, you know, the roots of Forms from and um, used as a food source. Um, arriving at um, Bonnie Lake, um, this beautiful reflection um, on the lake and aneroid um, on the horizon there at the um, upper left. Um, the trail continues on at center and then goes off to left and goes up to a divide. And you can then go down to aneroid lake if you're really um, up for some adventure. Um, again, when we were there in August, we didn't have um, mosquito problems during the day, um, but I'm guessing that probably during the, from what I read, the um, early season is quite uh, um, blood, quite a bloodletting. Um, again, probably a little bit too late to see a lot of the cool plants around the lake um, on this particular visit. Um, one plant we did find kind of in bloom, just you know, past its peak was green-leaved ballhead gilia, Ipomopsis. Congestus viridis, you know, this is a relative of uh, our prairie rocket or sky rocket or scarlet gilia, um, you know, with the sparkler um, red tubular um, uh, flowers. Um, this again is out on just kind of open scabby ground. Um, and uh, so it was nice to find this, but unfortunately not in bloom, you know, proficiently. Now, I do want to mention again, there are three big stream crossings and I think two other small stream crossings. And so um, I think Susan did the first one with her wading shoes and you know, it took so long um, that uh, um, just decided to do with, with hiking boots. And so, you know, just have to kind of find logs to um, cross on as best you can. And, and uh, um, on the picture at right, this is right at the trailhead or just past the trailhead. Susan and Hattie are walking about six feet above the creek on a 
on a log. So kind of perilously. So I'm not sure that I'd want to even do that, you know, three or four years later now, um, just because it, you know, just seems like it's kind of dangerous. It, the, the main problem with this particular creek is the, the downstream part of the creek. And uh, there's some sections that are, at least for Susan, she was up over her knees with, you know, the, um, the water kind of thing it wasn't super wide or anything like that. But, you know, a month earlier, um, this was photographed in August, um, you know, the water would have been much more raging like you see in the center. By the way, in the center picture, you can see um, Lewis's monkey flowers as well as arrow leaf um, ground cell, um, both plants we have all over the place in the cascades where it's wet. Okay, we're gonna take a, just a kind of a little bit of a drive tour here. Um, and uh, so this is kind of what it looks like coming up um, towards the Imna, South Imnaha divide from halfway. And so this was in June. So already you can see the balsamites are, are past bloom. Um, so probably Memorial Day weekend would have been a good time to come up and done this particular route. And I think usually most years you can get all the way around from um, halfway to Wallowa um, by Memorial Day. But um, you can see um, that the um, paintbrush are probably um, acute um, harsh paintbrush, um, Castellasia hispida variety acuta, which I'll show a closer picture here in a minute. Um, the light blue flowers, the light blue spikes are Idaho um, Frasera, Frasera columbiana variety Idahoensis, so a relative of our East Gorge um, flowers. And then in the upper left, you can kind of see some pinkish, purplish, or lavender flowers that will be um, the Oregon, um, Gardner's Oregon uh, paintbrush, which is Penstemon Gardneri variety oreganus, which you don't see a lot of places. So that was cool finding that. And then there's all kinds of other things like Canby's um, Lovage up on the uh, kind of to the right of upper center there on the horizon. Um, and uh, so giving you again a I wish I had the pointer so I could show you the, the route that we go up, but you, know, you can see halfway in the lower right there. So you drive east from halfway towards sunset. And um, before you get to Oxbow, you can see there's a canyon kind of going to the left of where the, the label Oxbow is. You drive up that. That's the, the um, nice paved road, just a little bit windy in places. And you wind up to the... Um, upper part of that canyon that, and you climb steeply, switch backing up. Uh, that's where all the flowers are because you're again, you're out in meadows and out of the forest. And then you get to the, to the um, south rim of the Imnaha, hang a right and go out to the Hell's Canyon Overlook. And uh, so the road out to the Overlook is well worth stops wherever you can safely do so because there's all kinds of things growing there. And the Overlook is great um, in uh, from Memorial Day through probably early July um, starts to, the flowers start to peter out after that. And then doing the drive as far as you can to, to where the, there's a gate um, up the Hell's Canyon Rim Drive and probably is well worth a, a, a hike if you're adventurous to go beyond the gate at the north end of the Hell's Canyon Rim Drive and drive or uh, to walk as far as you can um, along that narrow divide with views down into the Imnaha as well as the um, Grand Canyon of the Snake. Um, some plants that you can see in this particular area around the Overlook, Health Canyon Overlook, Greens Thistle, Circium inamonum, um, hard to pronounce, Idaho Frazera, which is this beautiful um, pastel, um, light pastel blue flowers. And of course the foliage is great because you can see that the um, outer edges of the leaves are all lined with kind of whitish hairs. Of course, a lot of us know Skyrocket Epomopsis aggregata. The one thing I would say is if you purchase that from a local nursery, um, be aware that um, it's a biennial. So if you buy it in the fall, more than likely it's going to succumb um, by um, the next spring because it gets um, it usually succumbs to fungal uh, infections. Um, Seven, Dip Mountain, Seven Devils Mountains, um, viewed from the um, overlook. Um, so those, of course, help you orient 
um, kind of where you're at all along the region here. Um, from this particular angle, I don't believe there's a real good view up to the high peaks of the uh, of the um, Wallowas. Um, a, a flocks that you don't see very often. This is related to our showy flocks and uh, long leaf flocks. That's the sticky flocks, Phlox visita, and it is very sticky to touch. Um, kind of low mounds of you know about um, six to eight inches high, and you know about dinner plate size wide, um, wide um, in, in terms of clustering. Um, well worth seeing and finding Piat um, penstemon along a number of the trails um, and also in the planted area at Hell's Canyon Overlook as well as the Hell's Canyon um, Canyon Rim Drive. Um, again, it's a big showy, showy penstemon sized um, plant, you know, one to two foot tall stems with finger, you know, index finger sized flowers. Sierra pea vine, Lathrus nevidensis. Um, you know, is very reminis reminiscent of our sweet peas, um, you know, distant related to those. And then um, on the right, we have the acute harsh paintbrush. Um, and uh, we do have that, it's, you know, it's a species that's all over the West. And we do have those locally near us. Um, and I do see them on, for sale locally on occasion. This is um, acute. Um, variety of acuta because if you look at the long tube, oh boy, again, it's hard without the um, pointer to describe, but um, the actual flower, this is actually an inflorescence. The actual flower is um, hidden behind those green tubes that um, have the red tips and that the, those red tipped um, tubes um, have an acute tip, which give it that particular name. Again, hopefully that makes sense. Um, Really cool to find um, on rock outcrops, Wallowa Lewisia, um, Lewisia columbiana um, variety Wallowensis. And so we do have a variety Columbianum in the gorge up at Silver Star. Um, when to say it's at several other um, trails in the Western Gorge, then we have variety Rupacola um, out on Saddle Mountain, um, which with, with darker red um, flowers. Um, this you can get from a few nurseries around Portland. And I've had, I think, two or three plants for, I don't know, 20 years. And they don't do well in the ground at my, my, my garden, but do great in pots um, where I can move them um, uh, under winter protection to the, the eaves on the south side of the house, um, which is where the, all my Lewisias are right now. Q6 camas is an endemic of the Snake River area in Idaho and, and Oregon. Um, and uh, um, it's a little bit drier um, habitat um, uh, camas, bigger, you know, it's about two to three feet tall, denser flowered spikes, um, and uh, um, kind of a medium blue, I guess, in terms of flowers. Um, the way that to really identify this from a distance is you know, it's got a whole, you know, numerous, numerous leaves at the base. Um, my great camas is already coming up in my yard and, you know, there's two or three, maybe four leaves that typically come up um, at the base um, for that. That's the closest relative um, viewing wise. The other interesting thing, this was thought to be endemic just to the Snake River area. And recently it was found in the Klickitat River drainage. Um, and uh, so nobody knows exactly how it got there because I'm not sure that this was eaten and unless the bulb was um, heavily processed because according to legend, the bulbs are really obnoxiously stinky and also pretty sticky. Um, Douglas's buckwheat. This is, um, if you've got Rust Jolly's wildflowers of the Columbia River Gorge, it shows Areogonum douglasii. Those were misnamed. Um, they're actually a type of rock buckwheat. Um, so this is the actual Douglas's buckwheat, which is fairly common um, east of the Cascades. And going north on the um, Hell's Canyon Rim Drive, um, there's big wet meadows of white-headed Waithia, um, Waithia helianthoides. There's Q6 camas in the background. Um, again, all kinds of interesting plants um, for those people who would rather drive and get out of the car and look at things. Um, so good, good place to take grandma and 
grandpa or or whatever out um, on a on a hike. Um, Sawleaf bush beard tongue, Pensman fruticosa serratus, um, gets its name because on the picture at left, if you kind of look in the very center, there's a couple of stem leaves, and if you look closely, if you've got a big enough view, you can see that there's serrations on the leaves. Um, mostly found in the Wallows Snake River country, but occasionally you do find it in the Cascades. And again, you can get it um, in the nursery trade locally here um, and, and, and elsewhere. Um, just a few other places to mention um, besides the Wallows um, that are clear, close by, um, well worth a drive in late, you know, mid to late May um, and a little bit after Memorial Day up to Zumwalt Prairie um, and uh, which is north of Enterprise and Walloa, um, or go from um, the town of Walloa, drive east down into the Imnaha Canyon, the upper Imnaha, or the lower Imnaha Canyon, excuse me. And uh, at the town of Imnaha, then take Hat Point Road up to Hat Point, which is on the west rim of the um, Snake Grand Canyon of the Snake. And there's just flower filled um, meadows all over the place and, and uh, rock gardens. And, and uh, so it's real pretty. Um, once you get up high, up past, there's a place called Granny View. Once you get up past that, there's some roads that go off um, that you could probably park and then go walking off on to stay on the road. You're not going to get lost. Um, and, you know, the, there's a big lookout, you know, probably 100 feet higher so that you can climb up onto and, and uh, look around the country at um, Hat Point. You could actually see downstream to where the Salmon River comes into the um, Snake River from that particular point. Um, and, uh, and this is on the west side of the Wallowas on a, kind of the southwest um, mouth of the, or excuse me, the northwest mouth of the uh, Minam River Point Prominence. You can drive up to, um, it's a fairly long drive, windy, um, but, you know, there are some places where you can, like Point Prominence Park, and then walk an old Jeep road south along the rim and, and um, you know, see flower field meadows and things like that. This happens to be um, Balsam Riza in Kena, which is a common northeast Oregon, southeast, south East um, Washington, balsam root, um, and lupinus lepidus, our prairie lupin, um, I think they're in the in the foreground. And you know, as we close out our program, um, this is a I'm wanting to say that this is a July view of the um, northeast part of the Wallowas. So you're looking at Mount Howard at the right, um, and. Uh, um, East Peak is the ridge, you know, there's a ridge that goes south from Mount Howard to Aneroid Mountain you know, that some people cross country hike. It's really rocky and, you know, there's lots of up and down on that um, down to Aneroid Mountain. Um, but another hike well worth doing, um, although it's forested for about four miles, you know, upstream um, is Macaulay Creek Trail, um, which is at the center. So there's, if you look at where the label Aneroid Mountain is comes straight down from the A uh, on Aneroid. And, and uh, you can see there's a valley there. And so that cuts up about five or six miles up to Macaulay Basin. And uh, um, so it was an interesting hike um, that we did. You know, the, the one problem that we had, it was early and we couldn't get across the creek. So um, we ate lunch and came back. But there were a number of things that I did see there that um, were you know unique to the trails that we had done you know so far the, the last couple of years. Um, so I do want to mention that uh, you know hiking with a dog. Some of you do that. Um, you, you have to be very efficient at multitasking while documenting nature, both writing and, and photographing. I think I'm photographing Q6 shooting star with some um, common camas around me there. Um, but do want to say thank you for in, inviting me into your homes tonight. Hopefully I didn't go over uh, my speaking time too much. Um, I've put on here a number of um, links that are handy for people to use. So, um, you know, the Wallowa Whitman National Forest, it's a big forest, also includes, includes the websites for the um, Hell's Canyon Wilderness and Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. So it can be a little bit confusing finding trails 
So if you don't find your trail in the, the forest, then go to the recreation area and then go to the wilderness area and you, you very likely will find it. Um, the, the one thing I find with this forest, because it's so big, more than likely you're not going to, you, you may get the person that's got the book in front of them that can tell you whether a trail has been logged out um, and whether there's water at a campground or, or something like that, um, or whether things are open or not. Um, but um, I find that it's, again, it's, if I plan out a week or so in advance, um, I can usually get a whole, you know, leave my name and phone number with the, or email address with the recreation person for that district or the forest. And they, a lot of times will get back to me and uh, um, can give answers uh, more specific to my needs. Um, so as I said, for a lot of the trails on the east side that I'd like to do, um, the high ones, they're not hiked very much, and so they're lower priority and only get cleared of down logs every two or three, maybe four years. So that's that's one thing to, to worry about. Um, and of course, I think now the, um, the district office in Walloa at this particular time, 2018-19, had moved to an elementary school in, uh, you know, old school in, in the south end of Walloa. And uh, so they were great, you know, you could walk in at that particular time and, and pick up manus manuscripts that you need, maps, that kind of thing. Now I think you can go and walk to a window and say what you want and they'll go retrieve it and they do the, the monetary transaction there. Um, I do also want to mention with National Forest Service um, kinds of things, um, they do like positive feedback. So I, I, I try to give feedback on trail conditions and things like that because they, they don't always go to the places, you know, um, where you want to hike, that kind of thing. So they do like information. And so they have um, um, taken care of problems that we've had, especially during annual meetings like uh, trees across roads or logging activity going on, on the, at the trailhead, that kind of thing. Um, I do want to mention plug less traveled Northwest it has been updated for, for a while, but gives you lots of uh, ideas on hikes um, and places to camp, that kind of thing in uh, uh, all across um, central and eastern Oregon and Washington. And so there's a probably about seven or eight hikes around the Walloas that they have listed, a bunch for the Ochacos, a bunch for, oh, I think there's a bunch up, up uh, um, in the or Washington Cascades and and, and so forth. So, oh, and then they also have a bunch down into the Snake River. Um, so that's a great site to go go to. Um, and if you don't get it here, then you know come back to the you know go to the YouTube presentation a couple of days and traverse to this particular pipe part, and you can um, get a hold you know look at the, the the listings here. My website's at middle there. I've got it um, um, set on uh, kind of the, all of my trips for Central Oregon. So I like to go to a region and then uh, hike and then list all the hikes that you can do and road trips, that kind of thing, and then give you plant lists and places to camp, that kind of thing. So that's the middle. Um, if you just want to visit the website itself and navigate there, then the HTTP colon slash slash science.hollyhosting.com will get you to that part. Um, or just Google my name and wildflowers and you're going to get to the to the website. Um, also want to put a plug for Oregon Floor for their plant lists. Um, boy, you know, those of us that are on social media answering identification questions, we're using Oregon Flora um, quite a bit, um, or the WTU Herbarium website up in Seattle for Washington plants. And then the, the last link again is the YouTube page there. So I think that is it. So should I stop the share here and Thank you, Paul, for that amazing presentation. That was very thorough. And I think we all enjoyed seeing those flowers here in the middle of January and a little bit of hope that spring will return. Um, Lisa, did we have any any questions from the chat for Paul? Uh, for this particular area, I don't know. And again, there's, you know, 
your, your best bet will be to use Mark Turner's um, book on uh, wildflowers of the Pacific Northwest. And, and of course the, um, you know, the big Bible flora of the Pacific Northwest by Hitchcock and Cronquist, or the two volumes of flora of Oregon that are out. Uh, remember mm -hmm. that the third volume is supposedly coming out this next winter. Um, so those are for the people that like to key. Um, as I mentioned, there's the, the older book, you know, the, the Guide to the Plants of the Wallowa Mountains of Northeastern Oregon by Georgia Mason, I think was a 1975 original edition. So it's not a lot changed other than the um, scientific nomenclature has been updated. The rest of the book is pretty much uh, the same and you should be able to find that at Powell's pretty easily. Um, maybe not quite as, as easy to use. Wildflower apps, um, wildflowersearch.org can be of help. Um, and uh, um, using again, if you've got um, internet access, um, the, um, you know, off on the trail up on a high peak, you know, using the Oregon floor project. Unfortunately, the wildflower apps are not, um, inclusive enough so you'll be able to find some things but you know the, there's as many species in the wallow as as there is in you know both the washington and oregon wildflower apps and you know probably 75 percent of the wallow is well maybe 60 percent of the wallow species are not in those two apps so um so it's you know, it's an underrepresented area um and one of the reasons again i'm trying to get out there is to um, document what's on the trails specifically, fill in some of the, the holes that are there um, for plants and uh, um, you know, get those on to Oregon floor at some point. Okay. This is the WTU Herbarium website um, or photo gallery. Um, let's see here if I can pull it in. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I would probably, it's, 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 I would probably just do a Google for Burke, B-U-R-K-E, Herbarium Image Collection, and that's going to get you that, um, rather than, you know, it's a long, ad, fairly long address, but it's a, it's a nice okay. um, website, got, got lots of good pictures, a lot, there's a lot of overlap in pictures between Oregon Flora and, uh, um, the Burke Herbarium um, image collection. Most of the invasives are um, really outside the forest. They come in, you know, on some of the, you know, roads, you know, where there's active logging, that kind of thing, um, or around campgrounds. Unfortunately, campgrounds um, get some weeds. Um, you know, packers, you know, equestrian people are supposed to, you know, be feeding their horses weed free feed, you know, a week before, um, but, you know, a few weeds get tracked into the middle of the wilderness that way. Um, cows, you know, there's a few, but for the most part in the interior, um, you know, there's, we didn't notice a whole lot of weeds, you know, including, which includes, you know, not a lot of cheat or um, bulbous bluegrass or that kind of thing. That's good. Uh, not to my knowledge. Let me just, I mean, I'm assuming he's knowledgeable enough to check, you know, OFP. I know he's off looking for those kinds of things. Let's see here. Um, let me do Eric Case. Let's see, Eric Case. Right now I have the um, Oregon Flora Projects um, plant list for um, the, wall, the Eagle Cap Wilderness up on my screen so I can look. So uh, nope, doesn't have any, in fact, doesn't even have the rhododendron columbiana. So, so, you know, you have to be aware that you know, books and websites and things like that are vastly, uh, or, you know, and they're fairly good, but, you know, not everything is represented, you know, that, that you can find there. So hence the, the, the need to go and um, visit the area more. Right. Um, take, take a second here and just because I forgot at the end or the beginning to say hi to all the people that, you know, I have seen over the years. There's a lot of long timers here actually tonight. So people that have been out on hikes with me or I've been on hikes with them, um, whether chapter ones or private hikes or whatever. So 
Um, I see Ron is, and, and I see Ron up there is is drinking some wine and and he's probably one who can you know talk about some of the other trails because he's you know for forever has done summertime week-long backpacks into the center part of the wilderness and and I think he's done a bunch up like Eagle Creek um, yeah Eagle Creek uh, up the Lostine and out the west side of the Lostine did you have yes. any of the uh, poison hem, a poison uh, camas? Um, now has it toxicodendron or is it toxicoscordian? Uh, toxicoscordian. Um, not didn't see any there. I know that in the Lostine that the, the um, Fremonts, no, not the Fremonts, um, elegant death camas, which is now it's now related to bronze bells, but um, that's that's in the Lostine, but. You know, again, I just have not had a chance to really spend a lot of time going elsewhere. I'm imagining it's up the Hurricane Valley, which is another nice place to go. Trail's a little bit sketchy. There was a question about whether or not you got out to Zumwalt Prairie that trip or in the past. So in the past, that Zumwalt Prairie used to be my Memorial Day weekend trip for about three or four years. Go camp up there, up at Buckhorn Camp Campground, and there's a trail that goes north from Buckhorn Campground towards the. Can't remember. There's a um, bar on the Snake River, so you can actually descend from the top of that ridge, like three or four thousand feet down to the Snake River and back, if you really wanted to. Great for butterflies and things like that. Kind of sketchy people during the um, during during Memorial Day weekend and Fourth of July weekend. And I, I, I would probably, you know, there may be some, but it's, you know, people who are, you know, uh, clothing optional, um, paramil paramilitary figure they need to shoot up 